All right, uh, if I could ask you to open your Bibles. Uh, we're going to look at uh, a subject this morning that, uh, again, maybe maybe I'm the only one that needs to hear this. I don't know. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe you don't need to hear this. Maybe it's just me. But I want to want to bring you a message uh, entitled "When God Is Silent." When God is silent. Uh, look at me if you would at Psalm 34. We're going to take a trip to the Book of Psalms. Okay. We'll take a trip to the book of Psalms, and, and I just want to ask you, have you ever prayed about something and gotten to the point of tears, and it just seems like God's not listening? I'm not saying that He's not, I'm saying that it seems like He's not listening. And you pray, and you pray, and you say, God, I wish you'd answer this thing, Lord, I, I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm taking it very seriously, and just quiet. Look at Psalm 34, we're going to take a trip to the book of Psalms, and Psalm 34. Nothing better than getting an answer to prayer and knowing that the Lord is listening. Look at Psalm 34. Look at verse 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. You know what? Every one of us could say that's our life verse right there. You know, we were just saying, hey, no one cared about us. We cried out to God, and he saved us out of all of our troubles. Look at uh, Psalm chapter 30. Go back. Psalm chapter 30, and uh, look at verse number 2. O oh Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. Man, nothing better than crying out to God. He, he saves you out of trouble. He heals you. Uh, look at Psalm chapter 22. Psalm 22. Let's keep going back. Psalm 22. Look at verse number 5. They, talking about our fathers, the nation of Israel, they cried unto thee. And were delivered, and they trusted in thee, and were not confounded. Look at Psalm chapter 18. Psalm 18, look at verse 6. Psalm 18, you say, why are we looking at this? Well, I thought we were looking at how God is silent. Well, I, I want us to see that God's not always silent, amen? And it's a blessing when God answers prayer. Look at Psalm 18, look at verse 6. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Man, it is a blessing to know that I serve a living God that listens to my prayers. Amen. And he answers them. Look at Psalm chapter 3. Psalm chapter 3. Why is there so much about prayer and so much about communication with God and, and, and God hearing the cries? Why, why is there so much of that in Psalm? Because David was a man that walked with God. He knew what it was to get a hold of God. He knew what it was to have prayers answered. Look at Psalm chapter 3. Look at verse 4. I cry unto the Lord with my voice. You ever done that? You ever just cry to God? I cry to the Lord with my voice, and He heard me out of His holy hill. See love. Look at Psalm 28. Psalm 28. Nothing better than answering prayer. Nothing better than knowing that God is there listening. But let me ask you a question. What about when he's silent? How do you react to that? When God doesn't answer the prayer like that. When you've been praying for somebody to get saved for years. When you've been praying for this issue to be resolved for years. You're praying for your husband. You're praying for your wife. You're praying for your kids. And it just seems like things aren't moving. What do you do? Look at Psalm 28. Look at verse 1. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Look what David says. Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. You know what David is saying? David is saying, I might as well be dead. I might as well be in hell. If you're, not, if you're going to be quiet, Lord, please answer this prayer. You know what's more scary to me? I don't know about you. I, I know something that bothered me when I was a kid. And uh, something that really bothered me when I was a kid was when I thought my dad was upset about something, but he wasn't doing anything about it. You ever, done that? You ever had that as a kid? And your dad's quiet, and you're like, oh no, what is going to happen next? 
And uh, I would much rather my dad raise his hand and, and talk loud to me and show his frustration or disappointment or something else than have me be quiet. I hated it. I hated it. And I can tell you as a child of God, one thing that I'm not going to lie to you, sometimes it's frustrating. It's when God is silent. But God's silence isn't always because he's angry. Sometimes it is. We look at that. I want you to think about this, though. In, in Genesis chapter 3, when man sins, the Bible says that Adam heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And you know what you see there? You see, man, fellowship with God. But Adam and God, they were tight. They were close. And every day, you know, they had this special time. They had this time physically together. They walked, and, and, and God would talk with Adam, and Adam would, would speak, and and commune with God. And after sin, the Bible says when he heard the voice of God, he hid himself. In Genesis chapter 4, the Bible says that then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That means that, you know, in Genesis 4, 26, there's a change. No longer does God come down and, and physically uh, meet with mankind like he did with, with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Now man, if he wants to walk with God, he does it by faith and he, he falls on his hands and his knees or he gets up and he stands, he lifts up his head, he says, God, I, I need your help. You know, after which time man sins and man falls. Communication with God changes. You read about Noah and you read about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel. Look at Exodus chapter 33. God brings the nation of Israel out of Egypt. Exodus 33. I want you to see that God spoke. God talked with Moses in a very interesting way, very unique way. There are certain people in the Bible that God speaks to. And I would love for God to speak to me like He did with Moses. Exodus 33, look at verse 9. It came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Later on, you read about in Joshua chapter 1, how God comes to Joshua and he says, Now my servant Moses is dead, and I will speak unto thee as I spoke unto, unto Moses. And Joshua leads the people of Israel into the, the promised land, and they establish themselves. And You know what happens after a while? They get settled, they get comfortable, they have their own land. And then you pick up and you read the book of Judges, and the Bible says, Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. And you fast forward to the book of Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, the Bible says there was no open vision in those days. In other words, God was silent. What had happened to the nation of Israel? Look at Psalm chapter 66. Let me say this. God is silent when I am proud. God is silent when I am proud. Look at Psalm chapter 66. You know, when you think you can do things your own way, and you have your own way of doing things, and figuring things out, and you don't need God, you know what God does sometimes? He says, okay, if you've got it covered, I'll just back up. Look at Psalm 66, look at verse number 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Look at James chapter 4. Let me show you this in James chapter 4. Say, why wouldn't God hear me? There's this thing called pride that sometimes gets in the way. You know, I love it when someone comes to me and says, uh, Pastor Adrian, how do, I, how do I take care of this? And I, I say, well, the Bible says this. Oh, I've already done that. Oh, oh I've already done that. Uh, okay, well, what are you asking me for? You know what you, what you really want is you want me to say, there's nothing that can be done, and your situation is peculiar and unique, and you're the exception to the Bible. I'm just not going to say that. You say, what is it? Oftentimes, as people, we feel like we have our, our way is the right way. Regardless of what it, whatever God says, it doesn't matter. I've got my own way of dealing with this thing. You know what God says whenever you do that? Sometimes. Sometimes. You know what God does? Sometimes what, what, what the Father will do is he'll say, okay, son, let me put you over my knee and let me give you a little pat on you. Amen? The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son of you receive it. You know, that's maybe even worse than God just steps back and says, it's a lie. It lets you continue on the path that you want. Look at 
James chapter 4. Look at verse number 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You see, why does God hate pride so much? I have a theory on it, okay? I have a theory on it. I believe because it reminds God of somebody that he doesn't want to really be connected with. You see, the Bible says in Isaiah 14, when, when Satan, when, when Lucifer rebelled against God, you know what he said to God? I will be like the Most High. I will sit on the, uh, above the throne of God. I will, I will, I will. He said, I will. You know, I can almost sit, ah, I'm bringing this to the I will. You know what Jesus Christ said in the Garden of Gethsemane? Not my will. But you know, as a, as a Christian, as a saved, and I believe, well, I believe everybody here is saved this morning, as a child of God, you know what you have a choice to do? You have a choice to either allow yourself to be led by your own human pride in the situation, or yield yourself to God. And you know what? When there's a decision to be made in your life, and you make that decision without God's help, and without listening to Him, and without uh, going to, to the Word of God, and seeking biblical counsel from people that care about you, and, and the multiple counselors are sick, and you, you say, you know what, I'll just figure it out myself. Good luck. Because sometimes, let me tell you something, sometimes the worst thing that happened to you is God's hand. Well, maybe on this one, I'm just going to sit out. I'm going to be quiet for a while. Because you obviously don't need me. And I'm going to let you figure this one out here. And I'm going to let you realize you really do need me. The Bible says he gives grace to the humble. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 13. This is a story that I know you're, you're familiar with if you've been around any amount of time here at this church. We looked at this subject, this text, a few months ago. 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel 13, and as you turn there, I, I don't want to neglect. Here I am talking about doing things our own way, and I am taking home to pray, so let me do that, okay? Father, this morning we ask for your help. We need your help. We want to we want to understand you better. God, I, I don't want to be, a, I don't want to live a shallow Christian life, Lord. And I, I pray that your people have a desire, Lord, not to live in shallow Christianity. Lord, sometimes the truth is you do things we don't understand. Or sometimes you're quiet. Or sometimes you just let us, uh, let us be. Lord, I pray that you just show us something about yourself today in this message. Lord, uh, I pray this morning, Lord, that there be a stillness about us in this church the ability to concentrate on the Word. Lord, we want more than anything to understand you better. Lord, maybe understand is not the better word. I don't to know you more. We ask for your help now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Samuel 13, and look at verse 14. This is God talking to Saul, and this is after Saul takes the, the offering and the sacrifice in his hands. You know what he does? He wasn't waiting on God. He was told to wait on the prophet, on Samuel, to do the sacrifice. And Saul says, you know what? I can do this my own way. I don't need to listen to that man. I don't need to listen to what God says. I don't have to wait for anybody. I'm just going to do it my own way. I'm going to do it now. So God says this is through Samuel. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him, a man after his own heart. The Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Samuel arose and got him up from Gilgal and gave you a Benjamin and Saul number of the people that were present with him, about 600 men. You know what bothered me about this passage? It doesn't even bother Saul, what Samuel says. Samuel brings the message, he delivers it, and Saul gets up and he says, Oh, well, uh, I'm not remembering the people. But I want you to see something. Look at 1 Samuel 28. And as you, as you turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel 28, here's what I want you to understand. Where it may take you 10 or 15 min minutes to read 1 Samuel 13 to 1 Samuel 28, you have to understand that's years in Saul's life. 
Oftentimes we read in the Bible and we're, we're going through and we read, you know, something in the book of Acts and, and a couple uh, minutes later we're, we're reading three and a half years or four years down the road and you don't realize it. Look, look at 1 Samuel 28 and understand that in 1 Samuel 28, this is years later in, 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 in Saul's life. You know what happened from 1 Samuel 13 to 1 Samuel 28? Saul doesn't hear from God. God is really silent. He doesn't say anything. And at this point in Saul's life, it's really starting to bother Saul. But instead of Saul getting down and saying, I was wrong. I repent. Lord, I want to hear from you. There's pride in my heart. And I, I let my pride lead my life instead of you. Instead of doing that, you know what he does? Look at 1 Samuel 28. Look at verse 4. Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pissed in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. Let me tell you something. Christian, listen to me. If you don't think you need God now, God will allow something to come in your life to show you you do need Him. Right. I don't need God. I've got my job. I don't need God. I've got my family. I don't need God. I've got this. I, let me tell you something. God will find a way to strip all those things away to where you realize, I do need you. And Saul, listen, for a moment in time, he understands that. Look what happens here in verse 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him, God. Talk about a scary place to be. Neither by dreams nor by Europe, nor by prophets. So what does Saul do? <clears throat> then said Saul unto his servants, instead of Saul getting down on his hands and his knees and his face on the ground and saying, God, I'm wrong. Lord, I've been chasing David. I've been full of pride. I haven't accepted what you said from the beginning of my reign. I've been wanting to run things my own way. Lord, I've been doing it my way and I'm wrong. And I need you. He does. God, if you're not going to answer me, I'm going to get the answer I want for somebody. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit. By the way, if you don't know what that is, that's witchcraft. That I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. See what happens. Saul goes to a witch. <laughs> Someone's going to practice basically black magic to get the answer that he wants. Why? He's full of pride. He didn't want to just say, God, I get why you're not answering me. Christian, can I say this? And listen, I don't know that this is the case. If you're going through a period of your life where God is quiet, maybe he's silent, I'm not saying this is it. We're going to get to some of the reasons it could be. But might it be? That there's pride there. And you want to do things your own way. And you know what's really hard? Let me tell you what's really hard. Let me tell you what's really hard for a leader to do sometimes. For, uh, let me tell you something. As, as a husband and as a father, if I go in a certain direction and I make a decision, and six months down the road I've got to say, I blew it on that one. That's hard. You know why it's hard? Because of pride. Listen, you know, we all, whenever anyone says, all have sinned. Everyone goes, yep, everyone's a sinner. But then I say, you're a sinner. You go, well, yeah, well, we're all sinners. No, 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 I understand that. But you're a sinner. Well, yeah, because we all are. You know what that is? No one likes to say, you are right. I am wrong. No one likes that. I don't like it. Why? Because of pride. Because of my flesh. Saul says, God, I, I need an answer. If I don't get it from you, I'll find it from someone else. Look at verse 16 in that chapter. Verse 16. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask me, seeing the Lord, look what it says, is departed from thee, and has become thine enemy. Let me, let me tell you this. Listen. Listen to me very clearly. From the standpoint of who you are in Christ, God can never be your enemy again. As far as being in Jesus Christ and 
being found in his righteousness as a saved child of God, but on a very practical daily living le level, there are a lot of Christians who, from a practical standpoint, they're not listening to God, might as well be as their enemy. You say, oh, that's not me, I'm not there, listen, I'm, look, I'm here at church on Sunday morning. Is that's not praise God. But can I just warn you about pride? It's dangerous. Pride will blind you into thinking you're right when it's clear to everybody around you that you're not. Pride will blind you into going down a path that will destroy your life when you're thinking you're successful. Christian, let me ask you, is God silent? Because of pride. I tell you, I know for a fact for myself, God has been silent with me before because I'm proud. Secondly, let me say this. Let me give you something a little more positive. <laughs> Sometimes God is silent because I need more faith. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Sometimes it's not because you're full of pride. Sometimes it has nothing to do with sin in your life. Sometimes as a loving, gracious, and perfect Heavenly Father, He knows that if He just comes to your rescue right then and there, you're going to miss out on learning something. Sometimes God is silent for a while because I need more faith. Look at Matthew 15. Look at verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. Thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Look at, look, at, look at this in verse number 23. Now, if you were there watching this thing, and you saw some woman fall down before Jesus Christ, and grab him and say, God, Lord, please, I'll send him have mercy on me. And he just keeps walking. What would you think about it? You'd be like, man, what, how cold can you be? I mean, here's this woman. She is making a, a spectacle of herself. She's throwing herself on the ground. She's, she's crying out. She's making a fool of herself to get your attention, Lord. And all you're doing is you just continue to walk in and say anything. Now, if you watch that, you would not think very highly of Jesus Christ, would you? Obviously, it's not where the story ends. But can I say this? Oftentimes, you will cry out to God, and you'll ask for God's help, you'll ask for God's direction, and you may even make a fool of yourself and, 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 and fast and, and pray, and, and maybe your spouse says, Why are you fasting? What's going on? And I'm just trying to get a hold of God. And you know, just tell you this, it's not because he hates you. And in this case, it's not because there's sin in your life. It's because he wants you to grow in your faith. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Christian. If every time you prayed to God, that prayer was just, I mean, immediately answered, right away. You go, oh, I grew in my face so much. No, you wouldn't. And you know what you wouldn't be able to do? You wouldn't be able to help that person who doesn't have that. You wouldn't be able to go to someone who's going through a trial and going through something and say, you know what, don't give up, don't stop doing right, don't stop praying, don't stop crying out to God. It took me years to see my spouse get saved. It took me years to, to see my kid who I, I tried to raise them right and they turned their back on God and messed their life up and I, I prayed for them and I prayed for them but they finally came around. You can't do that if you don't go through. I want you to see in verse 23 that he ignored this woman. In verse 23, the disciples basically protested her. They said, hey, just get her out of here. In verse 24, he finally answers. You know what he says? Uh, I'm not here to help you. <laughs> I mean, literally, look, look what he says. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Talk about a cold answer. He finally speaks up and he doesn't say, 
Oh, woman, be of good faith. Thou will be made holy. And he says to her, I'm not really here to help you. I want you to see in verse 25, whenever she got that explicit, let me tell you something. You know what? What we are very prone to do when we don't get the answer we want from God, we want to quit. Quit on praying. Quit on living the Christian life. Quit on being the example we've been trying to set for our family. Just, just stop. Just forget it. It's not worth it. I want you to see that this, this woman that comes to the Lord, she's a, 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 a as, as the Old Testament Jews would describe her, she's just a dirty Gentile dog. And she comes to the Lord and she falls and she makes a spectacle and the Lord ignores her and she keeps trying to get his attention and finally he says, I'm not here to, to, to help you. And you know what she does? She doesn't get offended. She doesn't get uh, a cross with God. She doesn't shake her fist at the Lord like we do sometimes. You know what she says? Lord, can I worship you? <laughs> then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. What is your response when God's quiet? Is it to say, God, if you don't answer me, then you don't love me, and you don't care, and forget about it? Or is it to say, God, even if you don't answer this thing the way I want. God, I don't see where the light is at the end of this tunnel. Lord, I feel like I, I don't even know if I'm in a tunnel. I feel like I'm in a black hole. Lord, I don't understand what's going on. But God, I know you're righteous. I know you're perfect. I know you're holy. I know you love me. I know you know what's best for me. And I trust you and I commit this thing to you. See, what is it? That's worshiping God. Christianity has this idea that worshiping God is, you know, just this kind of, hey, listen, there's more worship going on in that action than there is in this. This woman worshiped the Lord. Verse 26, I mean, you think the story would get better in verse 26, right? <laughs> I mean, first he tells her, listen, lady, I'm not here to help you. In verse 26, I mean, you talk about offensive language. Let's say somebody came in and said, hey, Pastor Adrian, I'm really struggling with this thing, and um, I need your help with this. And I said, uh, hey, listen, I'd love to, but uh, it's really not fit for me to take food from the kids and throw them to the dogs. I mean, seriously, what would you think if I said that to you? How offended would you be? And, and probably rightfully so. Hear this woman, listen to what the Lord says to her. But he answered and said, it is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Hey, if this happened today, you know what she would do? She'd pick up the phone and call the ACLU, and she'd call, you know, uh, the news channel, and she'd call the police department for hate speech, and she'd call all these people, and, 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 and CNN would be there, and they'd be taping Jesus Christ, and what exactly did you say to her, and how did you say, that's what would go on if this was today. And let's be honest, if the Lord talked to you like that, how would you feel? This woman had something, though. She had something. Look at verse 26, or verse 27. You know what I see in her? I see that she believes what God says, regardless of how she feels. You know what she says in verse 27? You're right. <laughs> and she said, truth, Lord. You know what that tells me? Hey, Lord, you're right. You, yep, yep, that's right, that's correct. I am a dog. <laughs> but you know what? If you throw the crumbs from the kids down on the floor, I'll look it up and I'll take it. I mean, read what she says here, verse 27. Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Look at verse 28. You know what you see in verse 28? Look at that first word. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith. He didn't do it right away. He didn't come to her and see that she was uh, throwing herself down and, and just said, okay, woman, great is thy faith. You're healed. Everything's good now. It's all perfect. You can go home and it'll be hunky-dory. You'll live happily ever after. You know what happened? He wanted to see something from that woman. And that woman is a great testimony to us even up to this day. Great is thy faith. Christian, let me ask you, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Is your faith, is your faith related to the answers coming? Or is your faith related to what God says even when you don't see the answers in your life? You see, she was saying truth, Lord, and she was saying yay, Lord. She was on board with whatever God said the whole entire time. Even before which time he said, you're healed, it's all good. 
That's faith. You know what God does sometimes? God takes you, you know, you ever take a rubber band? You take that rubber band, you can stretch that thing, and stretch that thing, and stretch that thing. Now, you don't want to stretch it too far, it'll break, right? Lord knows exactly where that point is to be careful of us. And he'll stretch you out and he'll go, okay, I'm doing this for a reason. I know it hurts right now. Listen, you know, if you know anything about lifting weights and building muscle, one thing you have to do before the muscle's built is you got to tear it down. Tear it down, it builds back up. Tear it down, it builds up a little more, right? You know what the Lord does? He exercises our faith through life circumstances. And sometimes you'll ask God to answer this thing, and you'll ask God to answer this thing, and it's quiet. And instead of you stopping your feet and saying this to God, say, Lord, you're right. And if, you know what, I'm a dog. If it wasn't for the mercy of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I wouldn't even be here to be able to talk to you right now. I know I'm a dog, but Lord, if you throw me some crumbs, I'll eat them. It's as great as thy faith. Now, sometimes God is silent when I need more faith. I don't know what you're facing. I have no idea. But if you're facing a period in your life where you're asking God to do something and it's just not seemingly happening as quickly as you'd like, sometimes it's so you can gain more faith. Let me say this. I'll say this to end our message. God was silent when a sinless Savior became my sacrifice. You know, when you get upset with God and you say, God, I can't understand why you're quiet. I don't understand why... You know, I've heard people say, where was God when this awful thing happened in my life? What, you know what I say to them? He was at the same place he was when he watched his son die on the cross. He was there. He was silent. There was a reason for it. Look at Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be very sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Did you not watch with me one hour? Look at verse 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. You know what you read in that passage? And you can read it in Luke, and you can read it in the cross references. You know what you find? You find Jesus Christ going and praying to the Father, coming back and finding the disciples asleep, and then going back and praying to the Father. And you know what you never hear? You never hear the Father answer. He's quiet. Fast forward with me. Go to Matthew chapter 27. When Jesus Christ is on the cross. I want you to see something. Look at Matthew 27 and Look at verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. So from noon until three o'clock that day there was darkness. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know what you read about? Let me say this. You know what you don't read about? Father answered. He's quiet. Why? Why was the Father quiet then? Because Jesus, listen to me, listen to me. You need to get this. You need to understand that sometimes God is quiet. You don't understand. You get frustrated. You better thank God He was quiet that day because that's why you're saved. He sat back and he let mankind, he, he saw his son giving his life as a sacrifice, and the Father could have stepped in and he could have done something, and he didn't. And listen, the reason why they, uh, uh, Jesus Christ uh, can become your Savior is because God the Father, when He had an opportunity to stand up and do something then and say something and call off the soldiers or whatever else, He didn't do it. He allowed His Son to be in that position. So you can be saved. See, sometimes the silence of God is really your salvation you don't realize. 
Amen. Listen, Jesus Christ spoke to the Father when nobody else would speak to Him for you. If you're saved this morning, you need to understand that there's only two times in the New Testament where God the Father spoke from heaven. He said, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. But on that day, on the cross of Calvary, the Father was silent. And as the blood came down, as the Bible says, the spear was thrust in his side, and the water and the blood came out. And as the crown of, the crown of thorns was planted on his head and pushed down, and as the Bible says, he became sin for us, who knew no sin. When I think about Jesus Christ, a perfect man, a righteous man, God in the flesh, becoming my pride, becoming my envy, becoming my lust, becoming my covetousness, when I think about all that, I think that Jesus Christ became the sin of mankind on that cross. Father saw it, he turned his back and he was quiet. That's why I'm saved. And if you're saved, that's why you're saved. So let me ask you something. Are you praying right now about something and God has just not quite answered that thing? The Lord's been testing me with something and God just sort of seemed to smack me in the face with, with this message. The fact that sometimes his silence is really our salvation. Let's all stand, every head bowed and every eye closed.